Uh, so we are going to today speak about the cardiac electrophysiology. So cardiac electrophysiology is another specialty in cardiology where we deal about the heart arrhythmias in fact. Uh, so heart arrhythmias, we all are aware those problems are present for those patients. However, how to treat them? So how uh, shall we be dealing with this? Uh, so as I said, it, cardiac electrophysiology is the specialty dealing with the heart arrhythmias in detail. So, for example, there are those patients uh, who will be having arrhythmias, how we can treat them, actually. So, this is the only specialty which is the curative branch of medicine, so in which you really cure. Normally, those alternative medicine departments, no, like uh, homeopathy, the Ayurveda, or the Chinese medicine, they tend to claim that they cure the patient. So, similarly, even in this specialty, this is the only specialty of modern medicine in which you cure those uh, patients in fact so let's that's what we are going to try to uh, read about the arrhythmias reentry arrhythmias and all so what is ep procedures how many of you are aware of that okay so what happens is this is also an invasive strategy in which you are trying to see for the electrical activity of the heart so a lot of my patients uh, you know they will be asking me what do you do so I try to say that I'm heart's electrician, actually, okay? So that's what it is. Uh, you try to identify the arrhythmias. You also try to see about its mechanism and the different properties which is associated with that so that you can help understand the mechanism for that. And you can, of course, help ultimately the patient to give them a better quality of life, in fact. So how do you do that? So we all are able to understand what is the cardiac conduction system looking like. So this is a bundle of electrical wires which is there in the heart. This is how the propagation of that electrical current happens and the cardiac contraction occurs. <clears throat> so starting from the SA node, sinoatrial node, okay, it goes into the AV node through the Wenckebach's bundle. There's those pathways as well, okay. And later on, which propagates further into the bundle branches on the left side, the right side, okay, and the fascicles, in fact. This is how the propagation happens. So, what I was talking is, this is the normal sinus rhythm uh, through which the propagation tends to happen in the heart, in fact, okay. And when we try to see the electrical conduction system, Okay, on a surface ECG. So this is how it typically looks like. Okay, so you notice is the P wave is the QRS and T wave. However, if you go inside the heart, so that's this is what is called as the intracardiac electrogram. So intracardiac electrogram is slightly different from the surface ECG. So the surface ECG, the as we all are know, aware, this is of course a surface ECG in sense like uh, it is measured from the surface of the, uh, you know, the human body surface. But intracardiac EGM are the ones, you go inside the heart and you can measure them definitely in a much better way, in fact, okay. So these are some of the differences. So uh, to on a summarizing basis, as, as I already said, it, surface ECG is more of a summation of the entire heart, in fact, okay, on the perspective of the leads, however, the intracardiac ones, you can go inside the heart and this is how you visualize them as well. So, this is a beautiful anatomical diagram in the sense. So, whenever if we see an x-ray, the chest x-ray with the heart, so these are the areas what you see in the sense. This is the left ventricle, okay, this is the right ventricle and these are the valves, valvular areas. And then comes the pulmonary artery, the aorta, okay, over here. And this is how is the further branching, in fact. So it is very important for us to be able to understand the anatomy. Because if someone is trying to not just look on the x-ray, we are trying to even have a look on the uh, anatomy as well. So this is very, very important for us. So, um, so one of the key questions always comes is, what is the standard position of the different catheters? So, if you will look carefully over here, so these, this is the standard position of the catheter. So, I must say, uh, okay, so what has happened in this is the coronary sinus catheter. So, the coronary sinus catheter here, it has been, exp 
inserted from above using the jugular approach. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll give you a tip as well. So if someone has been trained, uh, you know, from the devices, the person migrated into EP, they are the ones who still put it up from above the jugular. Otherwise, the pure electrophysiologists are the ones who put it, put the CS catheter from the down. So this is how you can really appreciate as well. The pure electrophysiologists or the electrophysiologists who were trained from the devices later on in their life, actually. So now coming back to these catheters, so the one in coronary sinus over here, we call it as a decapolar. Decapolar, why? There are 10 poles over here. And the other catheters, most of them, are quadripolar. Quadripolar in the sense, like, so the one which is going to the right ventricle, and the, even in the one in the his area as well. Otherwise, similarly, the one which is used for the right atrium as well, it is more of a quadripolar. So, uh, as I already said it. So, one of the key things, uh, why we are trying to strategically uh, position the catheter is we are trying to see how is the activation happening, not just in the sinus rhythm, but also in any of these arrhythmias as well. So, so if you will try to see in relationship with the surface ECG, you will be able to have a look over here. These are the surface ECG leads over here. These are the intracardiac. HRA is for the right atrium. Uh, the recording from the right atrium, the his proximal, his distal and the coronary sinus, distal to proximal, and this is the one from right ventricular apex, in fact. Okay, so finally, this is the one, uh, it is showing those different spikes. So his bundle recording, you will be able to see different recordings over here. A, his, V. Do you, and in the middle is the his spike. So this is what is characteristic of the his area, in fact. So that is why it is called A, his and V. And you will see in the coronary sinus, there is uh, 1, 2 is the one which is distal tip. 9, 10 is the proximal tip. So over here, the propagation is happening from the proximal to the distal. So because, as I said it, if you look carefully at my arrow, so if this is the heart, so the propagation is happening like this, right? So that is why you will be noticing, so the earliest activation is going to be in the right atrium, then going towards the his area, and then going towards the coronary sinus, and then of course towards the ventricle. So that is the reason you try to put up these catheters in such a position. So now, in this uh, uh, ECG, if you look carefully, so this is how the propagation goes, right? Over here, you can have a look very wonderfully. So now the, okay, after understanding the strategic position of catheters, what about the conduction? So you will also have to check for the baseline conduction. So baseline conduction is measured in milliseconds. You should always be able to say. And uh, uh, so there are two uh, cycle lengths which we, are, which we are concerned about. Something is called as the basic cycle length or the sinus cycle length. So you try to check it in terms of sharp to sharp areas in the time, in the uh, terms of like A to A interval or V to V interval. Normal, you can already understand 600 to 1000 milliseconds in fact. And then comes is the intraatrial conduction time. So what is intraatrial conduction time? So that is the atrial channel deflection to the atrial deflection on the his. So from the surface ECG to the intracardiac uh, atrium uh, deflections you are trying to see. Similarly, AH interval comes. AH is for atrial to his interval. So the values are very important. 55 to 130 milliseconds. Similarly, his to V, his ventricle. So that the range is 30 to 55 milliseconds, in fact. And those values are very important because on the basis of them only, you will be able to say that is there any conduction defect or any other problem as well. Okay, so similarly, whenever you are trying to do a baseline measurement as well, over here, you notice the same thing. So what do you notice over here? So this is the PI interval, we all are aware from the ECG. So then comes the PA interval, which you already right now learned, and the AH interval from the surface A to the initial beginning of the H, okay? The 
HV. HV is again the from the starting of the H to the starting of the V interval. Okay, and these intervals, as I said, it is important to notice. So 30 to 55 for the HV, 55 to 130, and PA is the 10 to 45. So on this recording, you can already have a look those different uh, uh, intervals which are measured from the surface ECG or intracardiac ECGs as well. Okay, so we can see it over here very, very clearly. So what is the normal activation sequence? So there is a slight difference between these two. So what is happening is whenever you start up an EP procedure, you must always take all those intervals. First of all, the baseline, the basic intervals, check them up, write them up as well. You must always document, then take those AA measurements as well. So for example, in this, it is 1100 milliseconds. Then you take up the AH measurement, then the HV measurement as well. Okay, you did it, everything. So what are, why do we have to ablate? Are we, um, you know, doing out of fashion or something? No. So there are indications. So what are the indications? Indications are someone is having a tachycardia, like a uh, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia, nodal reentry tachycardia, flutter, sinus, uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia as well, or even an ectopic atrial tachycardia as well, or maybe if someone is having atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia as well, okay? So what are the techniques we all have to think for? So there are different techniques in chemical ablation, or the DC shock or the with cryo ablation or microwave or laser ultrasound as well. Otherwise, you also try to give us the uh, laser or other forms as well. So it, regarding the mechanism of arrhythmias, we have already said in some of our previous lectures is there are different mechanisms in terms of focal, which can be automatic, triggered or micro reentry. Otherwise, a reentry mechanism is going to be there. Okay. So these are the different mechanisms through which. So on an overall basis, so this is what is happening in the access tree pathway. So for example, this is the normal conduction system and this is the access tree pathway. So what will happen is, uh, so the, uh, the re-entry circuit is getting completed like this, as we can see it over here. So what you try to do is, you try to take a catheter, for example, this is the left lateral access tree pathway. So you go, Make a hole in the septum, go over there and burn it up. Boom. Similarly, in the AV nodal reentry tachycardia, what you do is you try to see, localize those pathways, fast pathways, slow pathway, go over there and burn it up. Similarly, in the atrial flutter, so flutter, what is happening is this is how the circuit is going around over here. So you try to do is a try to ablate in the cavotricuspid isthmus region. Similarly, in the atrial fibrillation, there's a chaotic rhythm which is mostly affecting the left atrium, also slightly like up to 20% of the times also in the right atrium as well. So you also sometimes have to go into those areas as well. So, so this is how is the conduction which keeps on happening over here. So this is what is happening for the AVNRT. So how do you identify the AVNRT? AVNRT, uh, so, so especially for the typical AVNRT, you notice this, there is a pseudo S wave in the 2, 3 AVF and there is a pseudo R dash in the lead V1 in fact, okay. So that's the reason why the ablation is done. But even ablation is not just a simple process. So in that ablation, it is more of a high frequency alternating electric current which is delivered between the tip electrode of the catheter and the ground pad located on the patient's skin. So that's the reason why you have to also to be careful to complete the circuit wherever the patient is lying as well. Otherwise, if it, if it doesn't happen, the patient can get injuries as well. So always remember, whenever you are talking in terms of the heart, the measurement should always be described in terms of millisecond, in fact. So there are a lot of different pacing in protocols which we try to use for any kind of procedure in the EP. So something is called as burst pacing. Burst pacing, what you do is you pace at a progressively increasing heart rate by decreasing the amount of time between each pace beat. And this is the one which is used 
for inducing or terminating the tachycardia. So burst pacing, so for example, initially you are pacing at 400 milliseconds, drrr, then at 350 milliseconds, drrr, okay? So you are becoming quicker, quicker, quicker. 300, 250, like this, okay? So then comes, what is extra stimulus pacing? Extra stimulus pacing is also called as uh, Hein Valens, uh, Valens protocol of pacing. So I feel lucky. Uh, I was trained at uh, his center, in fact. Okay. And um, yeah, in fact, from one of his disciples, from Dr. Karl Timmermans, he is still a legend, I would say, and really a well known person, specialist in cardiac electrophysiology in the Netherlands. Uh, amazing person. Okay. <laughs> Let's get back to the topic. So in the topic wise, what happens is extra stimulus pacing. You try to pace, there's a pacing drive train. So what you try to do is, there's a 6 to 10 fixed pace stimuli at constant rate. So what do you see over here? This is what is the drive train. Okay. And then you give a shorter paced cycle length. So for example, if you're pacing at, all of them are paced at 400. And then over here, you pace it at like, uh, 300, uh, 250, and 220. So this is how it goes. Okay. So, so what is the programmed electrical stimulation? So programmed stimul electrical stimulation, as you already saw, there are various components of that. So, uh, what is called as S. S stands for pacing stimulus or pacing artifact, in fact. And then comes the S one. So S1 is standing for the uh, first stimulus in the protocol, which is repeated at a constant cycle length for a number of beats. So what is called as the drive train, in fact. And that is the one which is, uh, as I already said it, you know, all, almost up to 6 to 8 beats, in fact. And then comes the extra stimuli. Okay, so the, for the extra stimuli, what happens is, uh, as you already saw in the previous figure as well, I already showed it to you. So in that, what happens is, that is the stimuli which is added after the drive train at a different cycle length, which is typically shorter in terms of S2, S3, S4 in fact. And more extra stimuli that are added at shorter intervals, the more aggressive is your protocol in fact. Okay? So, so, after having an understanding, so this is what I was trying to tell. So, this is the drive train of S1, single extras. Uh, and uh, you are trying to give an extra over here. So, this is the single extra is called as the S2 over here. So, the drive train which is fixed for the S1, but S2 is the one with the single extra stimulus which you are giving. So, again, then comes this, uh, when you are trying to give double extras for the arrhythmia's induction, you give a drive train of fixed S1 intervals, then there is S2, and then you give the S3 in fact as well. Similarly, when you are trying to give triple extras, you can see drive train of S1, and the S2, S3, S4. So this is the concept of program stimulation, what you are trying to give. So whenever you are doing a diagnostic EP study, there are a few minimum things as well you should do. So what are those minimum things is? The measurement of the basic intervals, then comes the uh, refractory periods, atrial refractory period, then AV nodal effective refractory period or AV back cycle length as well. Similarly, then the ventricular effective refractory period, the VA nodal uh, effective refractory period and also the VA back cycle length as well. And you should also be able to write or mention about the induction and termination of SVT and VT as well. So what do we notice over here? So pacing is being done, okay? But what is happening in the pacing? So whenever you are pacing over here, you notice that there is one is to one conduction. One is to one, one is to one, one is to one over here. However, later on, what is happening is, later on when you start pacing at a higher rate, so what is happening over here? In the his intervals, you can notice, starting to note clear, clearly, so what is happening over here is, so this is the A over here. This is the A over here. 
so the cycle length is becoming quicker but over here this interval get, is getting prolonged over here right and then finally comes the block so this is what is called as the av nodal venke back venke back point so same thing if you look over here so these are the pacing spikes if you look carefully in, in the surface ecg so pacing is being done from the his right atrium you're pacing over here pacing pacing okay this interval keeps getting shorter and then there comes a progressive block so that is the even noodle venke back so same thing has been repeated over here trying to show you some more examples over here so the retrograde av nodal so what is happening is over here you are pacing pacing then keeps getting delayed 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 and finally there is a block so again these are the different uh, so for example this is the classically av nodal effective refractive period and why am i saying it like this av node because you are trying to pace it again from where are you pacing so this is being paced from the atrium and then what do you notice over here this is getting prolonged and then it stops the conduction is getting stopped over here so that is why this is the av nodal effective refractory period this is another example as well this is the same thing which is being happening over here as well okay so what is the effective refractory period effective refractory period is the highest cycle length when the conduction is happening okay conduction is happening and then finally it stops so this is what do we notice over here similarly so not just so not just in the atrium similarly you also have to see for the ventricular effective refractory period and this is how you do it over here in the sense you pace from the ventricle keep on decreasing the cycle length otherwise if this one for example is with an extra you try to do it and you notice there's loss of ventricular stimulation so ventricular capture is lost and that's how you notice the ventricular effective refractory period okay so over there it is and then over here so what do you notice over here the last bit is not capturing right so if the last bit is not capturing so you have reached the effective refractory period so this is the reason you try to perform right ventricular straight pacing so as i said it you are trying to do is for the checking and setting the pacing threshold also you are trying to check if the av node works backward so for example for the retrograde conduction as well and also for the v wink back cycle length measurement similarly you are also trying to check if there is anything else that tends to conduct backward okay because if you, someone may be having only a retrograde conducting bypass tract okay and sometimes it may happen so for example if someone is having uh, okay left bundle branch block already on the surface ecg so you're manipulating with the catheter and all and you do the right bundle branch block with catheter manipulation so you need to have that catheter as well for rescue pacing as well and of course for terminating the tachycardia so this is what do we notice over here yeah so the patient had a ventricular tachycardia you try to do a burst pacing and then finally you get the sinus rhythm and this is the reason why these pacing maneuvers are done so what is this display sweep speed in terms so this this is the display speed uh you know how you notice it so for example like the surface ecg similarly for the intracardiac ecgs as well so either you can notice it at read it at as your level uh, whichever makes you suit better at so the notice the differences so for example at 50 mm per second this is how it was going to look to you otherwise 200 mm per second it will be different so you can vary the different speed as well after having gone through all these basics we can try to give you some real good insights about the first most common uh, supraventricular tachycardia which we see 